Welcome back to PSS guys. Today's video marks the beginning of a new series where we're going to attempt to match the tone of several notable heavy metal players using nothing but, you guessed it, free VSTs. It's kind of, you know, my thing. So today's video is probably going to be the most challenging that I'll do in a while and um, because of that I can say with pretty much 100% confidence that this series is only going to get better as we go along in terms of accuracy and uh, explanation and that sort of thing. So I thought we would go ahead and start off and try to get one of the harder ones out of the way and um, the band that made me really search into crafting my tone with free VSTs. And that is Meshuggah, or more specifically Friedrich Thordendahl and Morton Hagstrom's 8-string tone. So I guess we'll jump in. I'll uh, show you what I was able to come up with with nothing but free VSTs, which will be available to download below, or you may already have them if you watch some of my previous videos and then I will show you how to get them. Enjoy! It's not perfect. Like I said, I feel like this series is only going to get better as we go on in terms of accuracy, but that took me a couple hours to get it that close, and it's taken me years of listening to Meshuggah to really understand their tone and their attack and their play style. So yeah, that's kind of why I wanted to start off with this one first, and uh, if you can get semi-close with this, you should be amazing with VSTs going forward. So. Before we jump into the world of free VSTs once again, let's talk about some prerequisites. Um, number one, you need a DAW, just like always. Number two, you need some type of audio interface. Anything will work as long as it you know, can handle your guitar input. And number three, you need an appropriate guitar. Now, for this video, this matters a lot more than the other ones where we just said, hey, you know, here's some free stuff, make a good sound of it. Doesn't matter what kind of music, what kind of guitar you play, you can make this work. So because we are attempting to mimic as much as possible Meshuggah's 8-string tone, we're going to need, obviously, an 8-string. Now, for some of you may be 7-string owners, and you say, ah, oh, you know, screw that, I'll just buy a pack of, you know, 8s, throw them on there, we won't have the top string, but, you know, who cares? Um, now, I say 8-string is a requirement because of the next point, and that is an extended scale. As you may be able to tell, and I can't fit this entire thing into the camera, I don't believe, but this thing is a lot longer than a normal guitar. Uh, this is a 28.5 inch scale. Most six strings run about 25 and a half. Uh, seven strings around 26, 26 and a half. I believe my other eight string is around the 26 and a half range. It's basically a seven with an eight plopped on the end of it. Um, now Meshuggah initially played basically just that, a seven string guitar with an eight string plopped on top of it with a bit wider neck. And it's very muddy when you do that. It doesn't have quite the harmonic content on the bottom string here. Um, so that's why I say that an extended scale is a requirement, not just a nice to have. Um, Meshuggah actually plays 29.4 inch guitars, if I remember correctly, with Friedrich having a couple 28 and a half to 29 custom scales uh, with his Ibanez triple humbucker you know, crazy looking Icemans. I, I love those things. Or Stonemans. Sorry, Icemans were the, the ones they played on Obzin's tour. But, um, so yeah, get you an extended scale and it will sound a lot better, a lot clearer, a uh, lot more pronounced on the bottom end. 
Now let's talk about some nice to haves, but not exactly have to haves. Um, number one, some type of locking system. Meshuggah plays with a locking system. You don't have to have it for the, you know, the uh, purpose of this video, but boy, for an eight string, is it nice because let me tell you, my bottom string on my other eight string never stays in tune for more than like two songs. So if you're recording, nice to have. I really wish Evertunes would just become mainstream already. That way I could get one for eight strings. Um, but this Kaler or Floyd Rose or whatever will help a lot. Another nice to have for Meshuggah, but not necessary, is passive pickups. I have active pickups, as you can see. These are EMG 808s that were modded to 18 volt. If you want to watch the previous video I did on that, you're more than welcome to. But the EMGs are going to compress the sound going in a little bit, and it doesn't quite have the dynamicism of a passive pickup. Is it going to be the biggest bottleneck in your tone if you're trying to do something with free VSTs? Absolutely not. Um, now, if you had all the other parts of the rig perfect, yeah, I would say go get their custom Lundgren uh, pickups, and I think I just butchered that, but I'm not even going to attempt it because I'll probably say it even worse. But um, EMGs will do the job, Simon Duncan's, whatever type of pickup you have, it's not a big deal because we're going to compress the living hell out of this guitar anyway, but that is one of those things that is nice to have if you have it, you'll get closer more easily than us who are using active pickups, so there's that. Um, other than that, there's really no requirements like, uh, or no requirements past that. You don't need a neck pickup. I don't think there's anything that they play in lead or in rhythm that uses it. Maybe a couple cleans here and there that um, will be recorded with a neck pickup, but for our purposes, you don't need that at all. And everything else, body style, completely optional. So, yeah, extended scale, I would have uh, some type of locking system would be nice. If you have passive pickups, high output. Passive pickups would be the best. If not, you'll get by. And with that said, let's try and get some tone matching done. Welcome back to Cubase, children. One little tidbit that I forgot to mention in the previous segment is the type of pick that I was using for these recordings. Generally, another one of those things that doesn't really matter. It's to suit your style, but to uh, match Meshuggah's heavy picking, you'll want to use something that's pretty thick. So sometimes I use a bass pick. Sometimes I use a uh, Dunlop, what are they, Tortec? They're not Tortex. Um, I'll show a picture of it here. That way I uh, <laughs> don't have to turn around from my microphone and, and rummage through my shit to find it. But um, something thick, something that, that's, you know, hopefully sharp and gives you just a lot of, lot of attack. So um, you'll want that. So let's get to what you guys came for in the first place. So... Just real quick, let's get a little bit of a reference to what I'm trying to achieve here. So that is a riff in Closed Eye Visuals, which some of you may recognize as the 2000, was it 2005, 2006? I think it was 2006 when they remastered it using some of their newer equipment at that time. So the tone I'm going after here is definitely more along the lines of their 2005 to 2006 time period, Line 6 Veta 2 and early Ibanez 8-string sound. A little bit of EQ, and this will work for pretty much any of their newer material as well if you're trying to nail that. Of course, if you're just wanting a good 8-string sound, this is a good way to do it as well. Um, and because of that, I haven't matched the EQ as well as I even think I can. I just got it pretty close to where it sits well. Um, in the mix that I have and you can always play around with it if you want something different. So um, this is what my guitars sound like by themselves. As you can see or hear rather a lot more digital, a lot more uh, bitey, definitely not as natural sounding as even the um, amp simulation stuff back then. But like I said, you can tweak this to get it how you want. Um, overall, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. So our signal chain, uh, still have a mono to stereo because I began this, I began this project like forever ago before someone told me what I was doing wrong to fix it to mono. So ignore that. You don't need that. If you set <laughs> your, um, uh, interface up correctly, you just record in mono for the gate. Pretty much same thing as I usually do release around 10 milliseconds threshold, just, you know, move it around to your, to your liking. I had a comment in one video, um, I believe it was the 8-string 
modern metal one that someone was saying that the gate settings were, were a little bit too choppy for them as far as start stop attack and release goes and i'm going to show you a trick that i use later down in the signal chain to mitigate that because the gate in cubase i feel does that um unless you sit here and tinker with it for you know 10 minutes i don't feel like doing that so um that's what i use for gate the boost pedal is once again my favorite TSB-1 by Ignite Amps. No drive, high tone, high level, high sweep. Um, as I've mentioned before, the sweep cuts out a lot of the bottom end and acts as kind of a pre-EQ for your guitar, and that eliminates the need to do a bunch of crazy curves before you go into an amp, which is always nice. Uh, also, I don't have boost and gauge or anything like that. So, uh, great, great pedal. You can use about any Tube Screamer. You know in front of it if you're going for a slightly different approach but i use this to mimic their fort and grind pedals which is something they use live as well for the amp i'm using the poland legion because it's about the most high gain amp of this class that exists out there um, i used a fortin vst knockoff type thing for one of the last videos this one i feel gets the mashuga sound more across um running the green channel input you can adjust how you want it's pretty good flat for me lead channel no tone stack although you can get a really cool sound when the tone stack is engaged and i think i did use that in the aforementioned video uh drive all the way up because it's mashuga um a little bit of low end boost sometimes depending on what i'm doing i'll just throw the low end all the way up um i don't hear because of the cabinet and eq i'm using but um, that, that's something that I know Frederick Thorndahl does with his real amps if he's running, um, say, that grind pedal or something that takes out a lot of the low end up front on the guitar. Then he'll just crank the bass on this, and that's how they get that thunderous just bottom end, even without a bass guitar. Mid-high contour presence, kept that all the same, although for different albums... If you're trying to go for the Obzin sound or, say, the Catch-33 sound, you might want to play with the mid, um, the contours, especially uh, volume all the way up, although it doesn't do a whole hell of a lot, except I was just trying to uh, outdo the volume on my reference track. And high quality, obviously, stereo or mono, depending on your needs. Now, this is where I start to shake things up a bit compared to my normal routine. Normally, I would throw a compressor back... Um, between the gate and the boost pedal and you know that's just to keep your guitars a little bit more consistent the way that you pick uh, and normally I would keep that ratio in the two range this time to get just that basically loudness 99% of the time it's you know very consistent um, as far as volume goes with Meshuggah tracks I decided to throw it in front of the amp and use a high ratio and just to give it a bit more consistency and more of that just full-on, all-the-time attack. So, you can move it around in the signal chain. Maybe it even goes better after the cabinet, whatever. Um, but instead of doing it back here, I felt like taking out a little bit of the amp dynamics and putting it in front of it. So, um, I keep everything the same, except I you know, crank the ratio. And um, I think the makeup was at auto initially so i put it up around the six and ha 6.6 because .6, devil so um you can play with that how you like but i feel like in vst land this is something you kind of need to do to you know match the intensity of mashuga's guitars for cabinets i played around with blending some stuff and i was never happy ended up just settling on an old classic the brohem mesa 4x12 v30 number two and there's six of these in this folder i played around blending two and a couple other ones and like i said it just never never really clicked anything with me um so just going to keep 100 percent balance on this one now something i do on this that i normally wouldn't on my other guitars is go ahead and use the high pass and low pass function on this NAD IR and something I really like about NAD IR that some some cabinet revolvers don't have a high pass or low pass built in this one does um, normally I would take care of that in the EQ in a second but I'm using so many other points that I ran out <laughs> basically so we're going to use them here 
and anywhere around the 90 hertz regions when it sounds pretty close and I just cut it off at 10,000. You can go lower um, for some of their albums, seems like to my ears, um, Catch 33 and maybe even the newest one, Violet Sleep of Reason, you got a little bit you know, lower frequencies cut off there, but um, I, and I'm not exactly sure the attenuation, what it looks like really when, when they do this. Um, but either way, it works pretty well, just around the 10 grand region for these purposes. Now, here's my trick for giving it a little bit of space, and I'll show you what it sounds like before and after. I'm going to turn off this EQ. Um so, like I said, some people think the gate is a little too choppy, and I totally understand that. So this is what it would sound like normally if I soloed it like a smart person. And, yeah, there's basically no life in that, right? It just kind of start, stop, attack, release, done. Um, and I feel like in the original recording... It has quite a bit of space in it, and of course it's because the guitars are not panned 100%, and I try to mimic that as well, but uh, just listen to how much space there is. And it's not really reverb, uh, per se, but there's just something about it that definitely feels more lively. So to try to match that liveliness when matching the track, obviously, you know, playing over it, I throw on a little bit of reverb, not a whole lot of time, less than two seconds, a lot of diffusion, hardly anything on the high end, and let the low end um, simmer out, because obviously, eight strings, low end stuff, uh, and not a whole lot in the mix, so this is what it does. Just a little bit of space, um, I think it sounds quite a bit better that way, especially with two of them. So that's uh, one track without EQ. That's everything we've done up to this point. Now the EQ, completely just trial and error, basically. Um, I know for a fact when watching the making of Coloss, I believe, just looking at their EQ curves, and supposedly they did it all digitally. They used the VST amp rack built into Cubase plus some different impulse responses. Um, I saw their curves and there was like some nuking going on around the 4,000. There was a big, you know, uh, scoop out in the mid, just like you would expect low pass there. Um, but I'm just trying to get it close through trial and error because what, the, what I did at first was play the track and look at that frequency. Um, spectrum that was there and try to match as close as possible and that didn't work at all even when I got it close because I'm using really different um, VSTs obviously so really different amps and uh, cabinets uh, in front of the EQ so even if I got it close it didn't sound anywhere near the same thing which is you know something to learn from from in the future when I'm trying to do these things you have to get all these things beforehand close or else EQ matching doesn't do shit. Um, so here, bumped up the low end a little bit, trying to gain a little bit more um, thump. And that's something that you don't even need if I feel like in the mix you let the bass guitar handle it. But again, I'm trying to match as close as possible to their... And you can definitely hear some bottom end on it. That could be post processing that could be during the mastering i don't know but just from raw track to track that's what i'm trying to achieve here um my initial original signal chain definitely lacked a little bit in the 1500 hertz region so i bumped it up there quite a bit and there's some sizzle and some fizzle in the high end uh, and i tried to get that in as well so we got a little bit of a bump around the six and a half thousand and because of the Low pass and high pass that are already there. You'll be able to see that you know it kind of tanks around around there. So let's see what it sounds like now. And if you look, if you can remember what that looked like, because for whatever reason you can't have two pulled up at the same time. The shape is fairly consistent with the original track, which is pretty cool. So. Let's play them both and see how they compare 
to the original thing. There's definitely room to improve, and I almost debated pushing this video back and working it on it, working on it some more, and doing another one of the ones that I feel a little more comfortable with calling complete, and that's part of some of the secret stuff. I'm not not going to tell you who they are yet uh, that I'm working on, but yeah, I feel like there's just so many nuances that you can't catch with free VSTs. I uh, tried a lot of amps, too. So I tried the TSC X30, the X50, um, a couple Russian-made one, Russian ones, like this, this Rectifier, um, the Fortin one, but the closest amp I could get was this Legion, and closest cab that I found without doing this for more than a couple hours, like I said, is this, uh, this Mesa. So you get a, a lot of digital artifacts in it, but... For what it's worth, oh, that's good. Neat. Well, that was cool. That's what happens when you have, like, you know, 26 tracks and all running almost, like, half a dozen VSTs. But, you know, that's that's the risk we take with trying to do everything in one project. Anyway, like I said, for what it's worth, I've tried out stuff like Bias Desktop, Bias FX, uh, Amplitude, some of the other paid software, and... Honestly, I can't get appreciably closer for the amount of money you pay for it. Um, this is not that far off, and it's free. You know, so I feel like, yeah, it has its issues. Obviously, I never expected to get as much of the dynamic, huge signature Meshuggah sound using free stuff, but... I feel like you're better off doing this for the time being, and if you want something better, save up for an amp modeler or something like that, that that's going to get you closer to, to the sound you're looking for. That goes for about any tone. So, like I said, in mixing in with the track, it sounds pretty good, though, um, I gotta say. Now, I'm not going to go into it in this video, but I would about bet, because just my experience doing it on my personal tracks, that if you duplicate the track and mess around using some different settings, different amps, whatever, you know, basically reamping, but digitally, I think you could almost nail it. Um, but the purpose of this video was to, you know, make, I try to do this as simply as possible, just one track, and um, see how close we can get, so... If you want to take it further, I say go for it. Um, for my stuff, I don't need <laughs> Meshuggah's tone. I need my tone. Uh, so unless I'm just like playing along to their stuff, I don't need to even get this close um, for the most part. And there's been plenty of times where I play along to Meshuggah's stuff for fun and sounds just fine sitting in the way I do it. So I think this is... Uh, not bad at all for the free stuff. And um, like I said, if you watch any of my previous stuff, you will have seen most of this already. It's the same formula for the most part. I just do a couple tricks uh, to to get this specific boominess and attack and release. I also have some other examples here. I play some little snippets from Catch 33. That's Obzin, that's Coloss, and that's Violent Sleep of Reason. Um, I think this is in death is death. Not quite sure why my computer is hiccuping so much. It's skipping audio like crazy. Uh, yeah, those in death is death. I think this is, uh, apart from electric red. Of course, this is all in mono, so it's not going to sound as good as double track guitars.
Um, we got uh, Do Not Look Down, I think. And then this is uh, Born of Dissonance, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so that just goes to prove that with a little bit of EQing, you could probably get, use, you know, using the same signal chain, get really close to all the albums using this uh, method. But of course, what I have now, pretty good for a general Meshuggah tone as far as 8-string stuff goes and a little bit of, you know, changing around, you probably find a rectifier VST um, and get their Chaos Sphere and... Uh, destroy your race improve sound as well if you want that so before my pc you know throws up on itself i don't know what's going on <laughs> uh it's not liking not liking whatever i've done in the past hour on this project though uh, i believe i want to call this video a day so um if you have any questions whatever please leave them below as always hope you enjoyed this hope this was worth your while um if you have suggestions for you know, other players going forward, I'd be happy to take them. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to happen, but like I said, I'd be happy to at least um, consider them. I've got three more in the pipeline, and as far as getting the tone, I think I've already got got them all for the most part, but these videos do take a while to make, so um, just keep a lookout on it. You know, I'll try to do them every three weeks or so. And uh, I look, I really look forward to the next couple ones because I think they're going to be a lot of fun. So yeah, I uh, hope that was educational and fun for you guys. And we will see you next time in more VST tone matching extravaganzas. Thanks for watching. Bye.